Red Love by Alexandra Kalantai, Chapter 10 Lisa had hardly left for work in the morning when the door opened and Maria Semyonovna appeared, a black lace shawl wrapped about her head. She was gasping for breath. It was hot, midsummer. Good morning, Vesalissa Dementievna. I'm bringing you a letter from your husband. He wanted me to take a cab to get here faster. But where can one be found nowadays? I'm all out of breath. As Vasya tore open the envelope bearing the address of the office, her fingers seemed petrified. Vasya, what does this mean? What are you doing to me? Why do you torture me so unmercifully? Do you want a scandal throughout the district to give my enemies new material to ruin me? You've often said you were my friend, but you've joined my foes. You've destroyed my soul. I can't go on with this life. If you no longer love me, say so openly. Why do you stab me from behind? You know I love only you. Everything else everyone says about me is nonsense. Ephemeral. <laughs> Ephemeral. Listen to me. I swear to you that I was not with Savelev Savelyev yesterday. I swear to you that I kept faith with you where I was yesterday. My heart beats for you only. I'm all worn out, Vasya. Have pity. Come to me. Let me look into your dear eyes and tell you everything. The whole truth. If you're my friend and comrade, you'll come. If not, then goodbye. But this you must know, that I won't live without you. Your wretched Volodya. Vasya read the letter twice. Now her heart was filled with tenderness, and the tears welled up in her eyes. Ephemeral. I love only you. Then again she raged. She had tortured him. He asked her to pity him. Had he had pity with her? Had he not tormented her? Her eyes were dry, her pale lips pressed together in a thin line. Wretched. You don't say. Wretched. All night long he had made love to another woman. He had given her blue silk. How she had begged him yesterday, stay. She had put all her soul into her eyes, but he had pushed her away, had shouted her at her like a real lawful husband, and had gone. Now he wrote, I love only you. He was lying. He did not love her. A fine sort of love, that. Only pain and bitterness. Yet why had he written goodbye? But this you must know, that I won't live without you. Surely he wouldn't. Nonsense. It was merely a threat to make her re relent, to make her come to him at once, like a fool. She read the letter once more. In the meanwhile, Maria Semyonovna seemed quite unconcerned, wiping off her perspiration, fanning herself with her handkerchief. Vladimir Ivanovich came home yesterday almost as soon as you had gone. He asked where you were. He went into the study and began to write. About midnight, he came into the kitchen to ask whether you had come back. No, I said, and he went away. Then he took Ivan Ivanovich to the door and went into the bedroom. He must have seen your note there. I heard him crying like a heartbroken little child. And he didn't lie down all night, but walked around all the time. This morning, he didn't even drink tea. I don't want anything, he said to me. Go and look for Vasilisa Dementievna. Go to all her friends till you find her. Don't you dare come back without her. Vasya listened, aching with the old love for Vladimir. He had waited for her alone through the night, had wept and suffered, had called her Vasya. And how hard it had been for her, how she had yearned for him. She had been jealous, so the threads that had bound their hearts together were not broken. Their love was not gone entirely. Why prolong the agony? Should she go back, back to him for a good talk? What was Vladimir Ivanovich doing when you left? Was he going to the office? When I left? Why, he was just telephoning to the little lady, probably wanted to tell her his troubles. Or maybe he wanted her to share in his joy. Who can understand these men? If only there will be no scandal. He called up the little lady? Now? At such a time? He had written a letter to Vasya and then telephoned to his lady. Lisa, Lisa might be right. He was clinging to Vasya only to, to avoid a scandal. If his wife had not been held in such high esteem, he would not have bothered about her. And he was calling her only to humiliate her again. 
No, she had had enough. She would not go to him, would not fall into the trap. Her head was wheeling. Tell Vladimir Ivanovich that there's no answer. That's all. And hurry. Please go. I can't go any faster, and it doesn't pay to hurry in such things. You should have thought of this before, Vasilisa Dementievna. Of course, Vladimir Ivanovich didn't wrong, did wrong by you, for you're his wife. But you aren't altogether in the right either. Who would leave such a young man all alone for months? And if you think about it, Vladimir Ivanovich is a good husband after all. Always worrying about you. Always wanting to know whether you're drinking your cocoa. Whether I've fetched fresh eggs for you. He cares more for your clothes than you do. He's never refused you anything. And where women are concerned, who is blameless there? You're his wife. People respect you. But on the other side, he pays her and gives her presents. That's all. As Maria Sem Semyonovna spoke, Vasya's heart was growing heavier. How simple everything would be if she too could think that. But Maria Semyonovna did not understand just what had hurt her. Vladimir was no longer her friend. She had lost faith in him, and how could they live together without faith? Don't you think you ought to wait till evening, Vasilisa Dementievna? Can I go home and tell your husband that you want to think things over and will give your answer in the evening? That'd be more sensible. But to talk this way, deciding on the spur of the moment, it's easy to make a mistake when you're angry. I want to save you regrets in tears. No, Maria Semyon <laughs> Semyonovna. Don't try to persuade me. It'll be as I've said. I'm never coming back. It's all over. Her lips trembled as she spoke, and big tears rolled slowly down her hollow cheeks. Well, it's your own business. I've said enough. You have to do the deciding. And Maria Semyonovna went. Again, Vasya wanted to moan like a wounded animal, to sob loudly so that she could be heard throughout the house and on the street, for it was all over. There was no going back. Farewell, Valadia. Farewell. Vasya wept inconsolably until finally she fell asleep, buried in Lisa's pillow, for she had not closed her eyes all night. She was awakened by the sound of an auto chugging away under her window. Whose car? She jumped to her feet. Was Vladimir coming to her for her? Hope and joy awoke in her heart. She pushed the window open. Vasya, the boy, was standing at the door. Vasilisa Dementievna, something terrible has happened. Vladimir Ivanovich has taken poison. How? What? Vasya flew over to the boy, seized his hand. Is he dead? No, not yet. He's still alive, but he's writhing. He's in agony. He's calling for you. Ivan Ivanovich sent me in the car. Hatless, barely dressed, Vasya entered the auto. Her teeth were chattering. She was trembling as from a fever. She had killed him, had hurt him mortally. She had refused her pity and her help, and he had begged her, begged for her in the morning, how he had begged for her. She stared before her with wide open eyes. They expressed not sorrow, but death, the inevitable. Vasya didn't see her eyes. He was telling, with an important air, just what had her what had occurred. He liked the idea of such interesting things happening. Vladimir Ivanovich had gone to the office in the morning. Then, after half an hour, he had come home. He had gone into the study, and Vasya had seen him going to the closet, where he kept samples of dyes that were being tested for their stability. Then Vasya was busy sweeping in the courtyard. When he had finished and returned to the house, he heard someone groaning in the study. He went in to see what was wrong. There was Vladimir Ivanovich lying on the sofa, only the whites of his eyes showing, his mouth open and foaming, and then the fun began. Vasya had run for the doctor who lived around the corner. He was just eating, but Vasya told him how matters stood. The man's dying, you can eat later. Vasya had to make two hurried trips to the druggist in the car. Ivan Ivanovich came over. The whole house was turned upside down. Vasya listened without hearing a word. She herself was more dead than alive. Nothing remained but Vladimir and his sufferings. They filled her mind completely. If Valeria should die, her life would be at an end too. 
there would be only emptiness, an emptiness more dreadful than the grave. She entered the house with the boy. Ivan Ivanovich was just taking the doctor to the door. Is he alive? We're doing everything possible. We won't be able to know anything definite before the morning. She tiptoed into the bedroom. Vladimir's groans became more and more distinct. She seemed to be moaning herself. Could Vladimir be detached from her, from Vasya? The bedroom was changed, different. The rug was rolled up, the bed had been moved, but the bed was empty. Where was Valeria? Something big, white, long lay on the divan. Its face was a bluish gray, its eyes were closed. The moaning stopped. What was that? Was he dead? Valeria, Valeria. The physician turned on her furiously. Silence, no hysterics. Assisted by a white-capped nurse, the doctor was busy with Vladimir. Both looked grave and severe. They did not let Vasya come near Vladimir. He opened his eyes and breathed more rapidly. He was alive. Doctor, Vasya whispered pleadingly, tell me the truth. Is there any hope? There's always hope as long as the heart is beating, the doctor answered angrily, as if she were asking silly questions. What did that mean? As long as the heart is beating? And suppose it should stop. But she asked nothing more. The doctor was busy. He and the nurse were raising Vladimir's head, pouring something into his mouth. Once more, Vladimir began to moan. Short, plaintive cries. Vasya listened. She no longer felt anything, but was absolutely numb, as if grief had paralyzed her senses, as if her being had stopped. Twilight and darkness. The night lamp burning in the bedroom. Other physicians came, consulted. The errand boy was rushed to the health bureau for special medicine. Vasya was not permitted to see Vladimir, nor did he ask for her. He seemed unconscious, occasionally uttered short, sobbing moans. She thought that as he moaned, his spirit was leaving him, that his soul was struggling against his body. But the body refused to liberate the soul. Helplessly superfluous, Vasya walked among the physicians, knowing of nothing she could do. Suddenly, it struck her like a thunderbolt. There must be rumors afloat in the city. People would say, a communist and a suicide. Why? And the gossiping would begin. She would have to hurry, hurry to forestall gossip. She would have to think of something. What happened and why? An inspiration, mushrooms. He had had, he had, had mushrooms for breakfast and now he was near death. She remembered such a case in her grandmother's village while she had visited there. A tailor who had come from the city to visit his brother had gathered some mushrooms himself, had cooked them, eaten them, and died. Vasya began to telephone. Mikhailo Pavlovich came first. She would tell him the details when she saw him. Now she merely wanted to tell him of the tragedy. Briefly, it was this. Vladimir Ivanovich had been poisoned by mushrooms and lay on the point of death. Then she telephoned the chairman and other comrades. She had prompted Ivan Ivanovich, who was explaining matters to the members of the administration advising the office. And very minutely, she told Vasya, the errand boy, and Maria Semyonovna what they would have to say. Vasya, keen and quick-witted, curled his lip, shrugged his shoulder, and said nothing. Let it be so. It was all the same to him. Maria Semyonovna, however, was offended, pressed her lips together and folded her hands over her apron. She refused to agree to the mushroom story. How can a man be poisoned so badly by mushrooms? Everybody will say, why wasn't the cook more careful? But Vasya insisted. The story had been told to everybody. He had eaten mushrooms and they had made him ill. Have it your own way, but it wasn't a very clever idea. If it had been something else, but mushrooms... Who would cook bad mushrooms? Vasya left the kitchen. Maria Semyonovna, however, couldn't regain her composure, banged about furiously with the pots. Here they make a mess of things, get everything all mixed up, and now I'm to blame. First they make a bed the devil himself couldn't sleep in, and now I have to lie in it, if you please. Maria Semyonovna is responsible. I can't tell the difference between good and bad mushrooms. How can they insult a person like that? I've been in the kitchen for 20, 20 years. There's no other cook like me. I'm as good as a chef. You should see my pile of references. Even the late Madame Golobova, the general's wife, who 
who always was so proud, never called me anything but Maria Semyonovna. And the po- Pokatilovs, the millionaires, gave me a gold watch and chain for Christmas because my sauces were so good. And now just look at what they've thought up. Maria Semyonovna gave the manager poisonous mushrooms. I didn't think such an outrage was possible. Didn't I do everything I could? I felt sorry for this Vasilisa. Never breathed a word to her about her husband's sweetheart. But that's how people are. Nothing but injustice. And they're communists. Why are you angry, Maria Semyonovna? Why do you feel offended? Vasya spoke thoughtfully, eating his soup eating his soup the while with great relish. Does it make any difference what they tell us to say? The truth will out. You won't be held responsible. They've invented the story about the mushrooms only to keep down the scandal. But I like it. It's an interesting business. There's passion for you. What are the movies compared to this? And you're having a good time, you silly boy. A person's dying and you think it's fun. What has the world come to? Nobody cares about life. The least thing, the least little thing happens and big b- bing bang, they've shot the fellow. That's why people don't really want to live anymore. It's all because they've forgotten God. Oh, forget about God yourself. I'm not a communist, but I don't believe in God either. And it's wrong of you not to believe. There he sits and chatters without doing any work. Why don't you help me clear away the plates? These fellows, these doctors use up so many dishes. They're forever wanting tea and everything else. God's will be done. That's what I told that dressed-up minx, the maid of Vladimir Ivanovich, Ivanovich's sweetheart. I was just finished with serving supper for the doctors when she comes running in by the back door, rustling her skirts, wearing a little Baptiste apron, spreading a butterfly on her head and wagging her tail. My lady sent me to find out how Vladimir Ivanovich is getting on. He's getting on so well, I said, that I guess he'll be standing before his God pretty soon, for God punishes everyone for his sins. But as for your mistress, that hussy, just tell her she'd better go to church and do penance. After all, she's the only one who's to blame. In Vasilisa's presence, Maria Semyonovna was very silent, but the moment she found someone else to talk to, there was no stopping the torrent of her words. The house grew still. People had come during the day, Members of the administration, fellow workers, the physicians had been consulting. Lisa shared the night watch with Vasya, so that she would not be alone as she suffered and waited for the end. Lisa felt that she too was partly responsible, for she had aroused Vasya against Vladimir. Don't say that, Lisa. I worked myself up against him. It took mortal danger to make me realize that nothing in the world is dearer to me than he. How can I live without him? His blood will be on my head. Her curly head supported on her hand, Vasya sat beside Vladimir's bed, thinking. Suppose Valadia should die, so that she could no longer live with him. What then? The revolution, the party. The party could use only those who had no crime on their conscience. But Vasya would never be able to forget that she had killed Vladimir. If there had been some good reason, but because of a woman's jealousy. If he had had... If he had had crooked dealings with thieves like Savelyev, if he had acted against the interests of the people, there would have been a reason. But to make her friend die because of a woman, and such a friend, she had thought he did not love her, but he must have loved her since he had gone to his death. So life without her meant nothing to him? In spite of her sorrow, this realization moved her to tears, to sweet, penitent tears. Gazing at her beloved man, Vasya whispered tenderly, Will you forgive me, my darling? Will you be able to forget, my dear friend? He stirred, moved his head restlessly. Water, water. Gently, Vasya raised his head from the pillow as the nurse had shown her and gave him water. Vladimir drank. His eyes opened and looked at her, but seemed not to see her. Do you feel better, Volodechka? She bent over him anxiously. He didn't answer. He opened his eyes and closed them again. Is Ivan Ivanovich here? He asked feebly. No, he's gone. Do you want him? He nodded. Call him. Phone him. But the doctor forbade you to bother about business. Vladimir looked impatient and fretful. Please don't torment me now at least. Get him. His eyes closed. 
Fasia felt a dagger. Why had he said that? Please don't torment, torment me now at least. So he had not forgiven her for causing him this mortal agony. She summoned Ivan Ivanovich. When he came, Vladimir asked Vasya to leave him alone with Ivan Ivanovich. She went into the garden. The red roses had withered away, but the dahlias were in full bloom. The sun was blazing down on her hands, her shoulders, her head. It no longer caressed her as in the spring, but burned her painfully. The garden was neglected. The honeysuckle vines entwined the lilac bushes like ivy. The sky was not blue. The heat made it look like molten silver. Vasya walked over the baking ground. No, Vladimir. No, Vladimir wouldn't forgive her. He would not forget. If she had come when he called her that morning, nothing would have happened. Now she had lost him, lost him forever. Not her adored lover, but her friend, her comrade. Valeria would not trust her anymore, would not lean on her again. Vasya was standing beside the acacia tree that had been so full of white blossoms in the spring. She closed her eyes. Why hadn't she poisoned herself? Why did she still live? Vasilisa Dementievna, Vladimir Ivanovich wants you. Ivan Ivanovich called to her as he entered the car and went away. Where was he going? Was he taking a message to Vladimir's friend? But Vasya no longer cared. The past would never return. It was hot. The scorching sun of summer was exhausting. The shades had been lowered. Vladimir was sleeping. Vasya knelt at the foot of his bed, driving away the flies. He had to sleep to, reg to regain his strength. He had suffered enough. Vasya and Volodya were alone in the house. Maria Semyonovna had gone shopping. Vasya, the boy, had been sent away. Vasya liked being alone with Volodya. She felt as if he belonged to her, as if he were her property. He was so weak and helpless. If only he could understand, if only he could read her heart. He would see how ardently she loved him, how she was suffering, how she longed for his caresses, how her loneliness starved her. Why was Volodya always so taciturn, so hostile toward her? He never looked into her eyes. When she did not arrange the pillows quite properly, he would say irritably, and that calls itself a nurse? She doesn't even know how to fix the pillows. Of course, one can't expect much from a sick man. Still, why was he like that? Could he really not forgive her? Never? And if they stayed together, would it always be as now? Lonely, dismal, bleak. She looked at Vladimir, at the dear, familiar face with its long eyelashes. Vasya had fallen in love with them at the very beginning, and he had been captivated by her hair. But her hair was gone. It was like the old fairy tale. Her hair had bewitched him. When it was cut off, her lover left her. Now they had loved each other then, in 1917, and later when the white offensive began. The night when, together, they arrested the conspirators. If I fall, Vasya, don't lose a single hour of your work. Your tears can wait till later. And the same goes for you, Volodya. We promise each other. They had held each other's hands, had looked into each other's eyes, and had gone to their work without delay. It had been cold then. The stars had been shining. The snow had creaked under their feet as Vasya and Vladimir had gone with their men. At the memory, Vasya's heart grew tender as if the warmth radiating from her lost happiness were melting, were melting it. Vasya had not wept when the disaster had come upon her. She had not lamented, had forgotten herself. But now the tears were running down her cheeks, not bitter, scalding tears, but gently sorrowful ones. She was weeping for the happiness of long ago. Vasya, why Vasya? What is it? Valadia had raised his head from the pillows and was looking at her. His eyes were distant no longer, no longer seemed to look past her. They weren't cold. They were his eyes, Vladia's loving, sympathetic eyes, although their expression still was sad. What is it, Vasyak? Why are you crying, poor child? He laid his hand on her curls lovingly. Vladia, my darling, will you, will you forgive me? Will you forgive? Silly Vasya, what do you want me to forgive? Now stop crying so we can talk. Sit down here, closer to me. 
here we live our lives side by side, saying nothing and suffering so. But you must not get excited now. I'm afraid for you, dear, some other time. No, it wouldn't go so well some other time. Let me talk, Vasya. I'm so wretched. That's why I wanted to die. And even now, though I want to live, I see no way out. We'll look for it together, Valeria. After all, I'm not a stranger to you. Are you sure you know everything, Vasya? She nodded. I know. Now you understand what was hurting me, and you were always reproaching me with silly things, forever harping on Savelyev. I know, Volodya. And you made another mistake. Did you think that was love? Did you? No, Vasya. I love only you. You, my guardian angel. You, my faithful friend. But there, Vasya, it's different, entirely different. Call it whatever you want. Call it lack of self-control, whatever you want. Only not love. But you were jealous of me. You suspected me, spied on me. Never, Valeria, never. How can you say that? Think of the blue silk. Think of your cross-examinations. Why do you smell of perfume? And where does Savelyev live? Show me. I didn't spy on you, Valeria. No, I didn't. But I was imagining all sorts of dreadful things. I wanted to drive away those fancies, Valeria. I wanted to believe in you, to keep my faith in you. Oh, don't talk about your fancies. You were jealous all the same. You didn't say so openly, but you tormented me, tortured me. Why go over, why go over all that? We're both to blame. Silence. Both were thinking. Is our life to go on like this, Valeria? Vasya asked mournfully. I don't know, Vasya. I'm lost myself. I don't know what to do. Again, both were silent. Both had much to say, but they could not reach each other. Might you not really be happier with the other girl, Valadia? Vasya asked cautiously. She was surprised that the question, question did not hurt her. Vasya, Vasya, I see that you don't trust me. Can't you see whom I love? Didn't I try to kill myself because I had lost you? There was reproach in both his voice and his eyes. Her heart was trembling with joy. Valadia, they embraced, their lips sought each other. No, not like that, Vasya. Calm down, Vasyak. My strength hasn't come back yet, you see. I can't even kiss you. Smiling, Vladimir patted Vasya's head, but his eyes were sad again. No, the, the, the wall between them could not be broken down. They could not find the path that led through the thorny hedge of misunderstanding from one heart to the other.